And I'll just introduce Beth and me just a little bit more. Uh, that's the cover of my book. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is Beth and me, and we come from Virginia. We live right in the heart of the Appalachian uh, Mountains, which is the Blue Ridge section. Anybody ever remember the TV show called The Waltons? We live near John Boy. Seriously, their museum, the Waltons Museum is not far from us. If that gives you any idea, we're Hill Williams, which are high-class hillbillies, all right? And I always have to tell people, Beth is not my cousin, all right? So we have issues where I come from, <laughs> but not that one. But, uh, <laughs> but that's what it looks like where we live. That, it's, that was taken, uh, I'm, I think, up on the Shen in the Shenandoah National Park or the Blue Ridge Parkway. And then we live down in that valley there called the Shenandoah Valley. And I write books. And that's the current one. I'm almost finished with another one on digital detox and withdrawal, what all happens and how long it takes by age group and all that sort of stuff. But as I mentioned before, I'm so privileged to be able to travel around the world. And one of my stops, uh, one of the countries, is in South Africa, which Beth and I dearly love. And uh, I have a great relationship with the University of South Africa, and they've asked me to enter into collaboration with their Bureau of Market Research and its Neuroscience Division, and these are some of my colleagues there. And I'm also credentialed into the ministry, and so I get to preach in various places, big and small. Um, it's kind of a, a contrast. To give you a little taste of what I do, I could be in a, a mountainside church that has 10 people in it one Sunday and then be somewhere like this the next Sunday, and I love every bit of it. And I work with the homeschoolers as well. One of my stops, extensive for the last 20 years, months and months, is in Australia every year and do a lot of research there. I work with law enforcement there, and in addition to preaching in the churches and so forth. And we get to do a lot of research in the schools. And then that opens the door for me to get into places that ministers, uh, Christian ministers would not normally get into. And when I go there, I do my very best to let my light so shine that people will glorify our God in heaven. So it's a lot of missions work involved, and the door opener is digital addiction because these children are addicted to pornography, Netflix binging, social media. You wouldn't think so, but they are. And my guess is they're losing their interest in the Quran just like our kids are losing interest in the Bible. And so they've asked me to come in, and, and they trust me, and I, I value that. And, um, but I'm a Christian, and that's what I represent. So I get to spend time in the media talking about all of this sort of stuff. So I hope that gives you just a brief introduction of what we are about. The men's conference this weekend has been awesome, hasn't it, men? I have never, Pastor, felt freer at a men's conference to be able to be who I am. And I, I'm not being funny when I say this. Confess my sins and have the strength of men around me who are also struggling, but we all get into the presence of God together and watch God work. And that's what he did. And I thank you, Pastor, for your leadership. And I, you know what? And I'm being serious. We joke and care, pick on each other mercilessly. We had fun doing that today, but I, am, I thank God for my friendship with you. I do. I really do. All right. Um, I want to play something for you. I played this to the men. This is uh, to test our audio. <laughs> This is what happens when an emergency call comes in in hillbilly country. I'm glad we're testing the audio. Um, <laughs> guess what, William? <laughs> um, don't come up here, William. I'll take care of this. Because <laughs> clearly you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> don't you hit me. I know he was in law enforcement, so don't you shoot me either. <laughs> or taser me, for goodness sakes. I hate it when people taser me. <laughs> I've never been tasered. But once. <laughs> All right. All right, guys in the back, you ready? Here we go. Let's try this again. <laughs> All right, a... now, I had to turn my own volume. Is there anything else you'd like me to do before we show this? <laughs> All right, here we go. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, um, my wife got attacked by a warthog real bad, and I need someone to come up with an ambulance and pick her up. Okay, sir, uh, can you give me your address? Uh, yeah, we're at 1825 Eucalyptus Drive. Okay, could you spell that for me, sir? Uh... I, I'm going to drag her on over to Oak Street, and you can pick her up there. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Hillbilly country. Somebody asked me today, do you ever watch NASCAR? <laughs> it's, it's the Appalachian Mountain religion. You have to. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not saved. All right. I want to describe to you what anhedonia is. We've talked about this quite a bit. And this is the most scary thing to me, and this is what I want to lead with outside of giving you the teaser for the metaverse, but at the root and the heart of all of this, whether it be AI 1.0, 2.0, this to me is the most important thing to understand. This is what technology does at any level, and it doesn't matter what the content is. It can be, you know, education apps. It could be Bible Gateway. It, and not everything is sinful. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about the effect on the brain. So there's a condition that used to only exist, or at least it was only known to exist, in schizophrenics, people with severe major depressive disorders and severe drug addicts, and it's called anhedonia. And the root word there is hedonism, hedonia, which means the constant ongoing pursuit of pleasure, and then an means no. So you lose your feeling, you lose your pleasure, the ability to enjoy things. And what it does, it leaves children saying, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. And... I want to show you these brain animations. So right there in the middle, or that, where that little dot is, that area is called the pleasure center of the brain, or the nucleus accumbens. And when you were laughing at the hillbilly call, uh, the, the 911 call from hillbilly country, that is the area of the brain that received a little squirt of dopamine because I engaged your eyes onto that screen. I tickled your temporal lobes, your ears. And through that brain stimulation, I knew that I had uh, changed the chemicals in your brain because I heard you laughing. And I didn't touch you. I used your eyes to do that. And I did it on purpose to illustrate what I'm talking about. I didn't give you enough to get you addicted. Uh, but, and it felt good to you. And it's, laughter is like a medicine. In other words, not everything we do on a screen is sinful. Amen? It can be, though. So... When we stimulate ourselves, whether it be through traditional drugs or whether it be through new drugs, the digital drugs, those little spurts of dopamine go inside of the pleasure center there, and on scans, it'll light up. That's why I illustrated it, animated it, lighting up. And if you'll notice, there's a little wall that's forming, and that wall is called tolerance or resistance. What's happening is, in the neurons in the brain, there's, there's electricity flowing through there, and then there's dopamine. It'll go from one neuron to the other, and there's dopamine receptors over here. What did I do this time? Oh, William did it. <laughs> Don't you shoot me. <laughs> I'll spider monkey you. <laughs> the, men are, the men get that. <laughs> I digress. I'm sorry. I'll let you in on that later. <laughs> So what ends up happening is the dopamine receptors clog up and you stop feeling because the dopamine's not flowing because the brain is trying to push it out, trying to defend itself from all that overstimulation, stressing it. And so the alcoholic doesn't start off being an alcoholic. The alcoholic started off this way. They come home from work, drink a couple of beers to decompress, and that beer causes stress relief because the alcohol is stimulating the brain and the brain secretes dopamine, it goes into the pleasure center, and it relieves you of stress. But the problem is, that once the wall forms, your body adjusts to that, your brain adjusts to that, you have to then drink three beers, not to get more drunk, but just to feel at the same level, because the wall is there, you've got to penetrate that wall. And that works for a while, and then it stops working, then what do you have to do? You have to drink four, and you see the progression, and then you become habituated to it. Well... That very same mechanism of that wall that happens to traditional drugs happens with screens. Exactly. Identical. And it's very quick. And in children, it's instant. And I'm going to say some things that I don't want you to feel condemned. I really don't. And it is scary. I can't get around that. But here's the truth. If you raised your children with tablets and devices... I don't necessarily blame you. It's the best babysitter that's ever been invented, and it works every time. But as you know, over time, that screen time has to increase, and then every time you take it away, the fits and the tantrums increase. And that's just the truth. And it's because they have the equivalent of cocaine addiction in a child. 
And I know what that sounds like, and I want you to understand me. You not, you're not evil people. Nobody purposely did that to their children. If you did it on purpose, that would be one thing. But nobody's done this on purpose. I was heavily addicted to technology. Not now. I could be again tonight. But the point that I, and what I'm all about is rest, the restoration of the intimacy with God that has been stolen. So let's talk about that. Let's put the brain animation back up there. But here's how you lose your feeling. If you don't deal with the addiction, the habituation, and stop, not balance, not limit, not back away and do less, and only do it on Saturday, but quit, that, br that brain wall will get so big, if you notice, it stopped lighting up in the middle. And on brain scans, you can clearly see that the brain has shut down, and the, no the natural color from analog activities, somebody asked me today, sometimes I need to define things, ask me what analog is. Um, analog refers to non-digital and then there's digital. Does that make sense? And I humorously say with analog, do you remember paper? <laughs> remember the, when we used to have paper? Uh, that's analog. All right, so here's what happens. The wall gets really big. It pushes out all the dopamine, and you stop feeling, and you have anhedonia. There are a couple of documentaries that I would recommend that you watch. One is called The Social Dilemma. The other is called Childhood 2.0. And I put together a little montage of what anhedonia looks like in children and in high schoolers once they have pushed the boundary with their video games and social media to that brink where that wall is really big. Suicide is always the result of many, um, many factors. As we are not teaching kids as many skills to self-regulate and deal with difficult emotions, well, one thing that a device can be is a great way to distract. Not being able to have my phone for a week, definitely, like I would get really bored and I feel like I would be stressed out. Typically when I get bored, I do pick up my phone. Like I had people to talk to, but they got bored. I don't know, it's just like something that I do when I'm bored. Oftentimes it's a child who's simply bored. Yeah, I'm pretty much bored. And I get so bored. Sometimes when I'm bored. Because they were bored. And they're bored. Boredom. He is so bored. My mindset just got worse and worse just because I felt so unproductive and I wasn't doing anything. And I felt like that's pretty common. You know, most kids are bored, cooped up, and feel unproductive. At 12, here again, I was helping my dad. We still were still milking cows. We were still raising hogs, carrying water. We still didn't have electricity. I had to have the tractor gassed up, everything hooked up and ready to go. So I mowed their lawns, some housework for those folks. I didn't even know the word bored. And if we continually interrupt that boredom with distraction, with screens, I think that we are removing kids' abilities to deal with their own thoughts. And then that carries the risk then of being in a situation where parents are fixing everything. And you combine that with situations in high school where parents have fixed everything. I've not been taught how to deal with my own thoughts. Life is kind of hard. I have no idea what to do with this. Anhedonia, I'm bored. And it's because they have a wall, and yet they have the most stimulating activities on earth, way more than any generation in history, but they're bored. It's because they have built up resistance tolerance to the digital drug. Am I making sense to you? Now, here's the danger, and here's what weighs on me. There are activities that generate more dopamine than others. By far, the ones that generate the most would be in this order, pornography. It's way up there, followed by video games and social media. They're almost equal. And they cause the wall to go up quickly, porn instantly. And once that happens, once that wall gets to a certain level, if you're not doing an activity that generates enough dopamine to get over that wall or penetrate it, those dopamine receptors that are clogged, if you're doing an activity that generates this much dopamine, you're going to be bored. So if you tell a kid, go outside and play, and they've got a wall, what are they going to say? I'm bored. That's boring. If you tell them, let's go to youth group, what are they going to say? But they might make an excuse that the youth pastor is worthless. Oh, is he the youth pastor? <laughs> Not. But, but I'll defend you, though, because they come to you with a wall, and you can't compete. I don't care how many games you play. I don't care how good your sermon is. 
It's analog. And I will defend him against any accusation to say he's boring. I will say, no, you brought that with you because of what you're doing at home. That's not the church's fault. And then they want to blame the school too. The school is boring. I'm like, no, you brought that to school. Am I making sense? And when you get that way, intimacy, we know what that is. Everybody's intimate, whether it be to football, whether it be to NASCAR racing where I'm from, or whether it be to God. That's when you're emotionally attached. I mean, you are glued. That's what's on your mind all the time. Well, when you have that wall, whatever it is that you're doing to try to get enough dopamine, that activity to, to penetrate that barrier, that's what you're intimate with. And God and his activities generate this much dopamine. That's the normal, natural amount that you need for cognition. And that is what scares me the most. And with the metaverse, you think we have stimulation now in a 2D world? Wait till we're entering into a 3D world. It's going to put the nail in the coffin. And I carry this weight everywhere I go. <laughs> I sometimes think, can't God, for two weeks I'll be a motivational speaker and ride in the front of the plane and have people throw money at me? <laughs> <laughs> Just for two weeks. I just want first class for two weeks. And just have people go, give him money. He makes me feel good. <laughs> That's what I wish. He's not answered that prayer. I'm making you laugh because someone famous once said, make them laugh or they will kill you. <laughs> so I'll make you laugh. Because the exits, well, they're pretty close. I'll be all right. I'll still... Now I feel like I can make you mad. <laughs> no, I'm not, not trying to make you mad. Um, I work in, as I mentioned, I work in law enforcement. When I'm in Australia, I work with Sergeant Nigel Dalton of the Queensland Police. He's in charge of the Crime Prevention Unit, and cyber comes into that. So they bring me in to do these talks to the kids, to the parents, and to companies and different things. Uh, like I'm doing with you, it's secular. Uh, we go into Christian schools. We go into a lot of public schools and things like that, uh, government schools. And Nigel is a Christian. And um, we were in the police car for two, three weeks at a time, going from place to place to place. And um, he called me one night, and he said, you know, I was on my way home, and he, and he said, I, I took a call. The call came over the radio that a, a, a young boy, I think he was 11, he was taking a screwdriver, and he was hacking away at all the walls in the house and just destroying the house. And he was fairly close, so even though he was off work, he took the call, and he just said, to the Lord, Lord, help me help this child. He didn't know what was going on, knew nothing. He just prayed, God, help me to help, because he's like that, aren't you? Fund the police, amen? amen? Fund the police. So he, he took the call, and when he got there, sure enough, this kid was just in an absolute berserk mode, and he was trashing everything. And I want to show you what, what was happening here. He sent me the pictures you see there's a bathtub here. He was filling up the sinks and, and trashing the house by letting water overflow. The mother was scared to death of him, and he was tearing everything out of the closets and throwing it everywhere. And he was just destroying everything in sight. And he poured glue all over the floor. I mean, just in a mental state. And so when Nigel finally got him calmed down and asked him, you know, hey, what's going on with you? Um, he said, well... Uh, I was out playing video games with my, my mates, and when I came home, mom, I wanted to continue gaming. Mom turned the router off because she was tired of me playing games, so I got back at her. That's a withdrawal because the number one symptom of digital addiction is anger and aggression combined. And it can get that bad. Most of you have kids. You've seen the anger and aggression at some level. If you let it persist, that's what happens. You don't always start there. But this is the sort of thing that we deal with all the time. And yet most people think their children are the exception to this. So I don't always want to just pick on the kids. In her case, look, it's easy. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I don't want to just armchair quarterback her, all right? Obviously, 
you don't want to let that happen to begin with. So that's what I'm trying to do here is prevention. But most of us have to backtrack now. Unless you have little children, then you're in a good position to do prevention. So I want to help both. Not condemn you, but help. Do you hear my heart? Because this stuff is hard to hear. I told you just a few minutes ago that most of the time the, the, the parents are worse than the kids. And it's absolutely true with these demographics of how the parents are, are more addicted. I want to show you in the case where typically, and if you look at the stats of video gaming, it's 35 to 44, and it's way more males than females. There are females that game, but typically you have way more females that are into the social media. Everybody does social media. Most people do games, but if you talk about the amount of time that they spend on it, it's mainly gaming is a guy thing, social media is a female thing, and there's crossover, but the amount of time they spend. But I want to show you what happens when a mother loses empathy or gets bored with their child, because a child generates the proper amount of dopamine, but she has a wall. So have a look. I let that play long, longer than, you, than a presenter is supposed to. You're supposed to keep everything real brief. I let that play long on purpose. This is rhetorical. I don't want you to raise your hand or anything, but the reason why is because I know what happens. Females who do this internally are thinking something like this, I imagine. Okay, that's enough. I got it. Uh, you can turn it off now. I'm uncomfortable. That... I got it. Turn it off. I don't want to turn it off. I want you to really get it. Listen, God does not treat us that way. Aren't you glad? And our job as adults is to model him to kids. And God doesn't do that, nor should we. That's intimacy. She's intimate. She is very, very intimate, but not with her child, with social media. I want that to sink in. That's where her heart is. That's what she's given her heart to. It's true biblical idolatry in that sense. I'm not here to condemn you, brothers and sisters. Do you hear my heart? This, this weighs on me because we see this everywhere we go around the world. This is not just, I mean, and it, for the body of Christ, we must, in Jesus' name, separate ourselves from that. We must. We have lost two generations. So I want to show you another brief clip on social media and, and mental health. Do you guys feel like teachers and adults and parents in general have kind of abandoned helping you through the social media thing in life? It's also like we shield stuff from our parents too. So like they don't really know. Sneaky. Like I don't blame them so for not true. being able to help because we don't ask for help. I definitely feel like us as kids kind of got put in a, in a tough spot. You know, in between two worlds. This is all new for us as parents. We, we, this, this technology and this, and this world has kind of has crept up on us 
and there is so many of us who could do better. Like, my parents would be, like, heartbroken that, like, their kids have to go through this. Over half of tweens and uh, close to three-fourths of teens experience issues regarding mental health. And then we get into cyberbullying, and that's over three-fourths. Then we get to sexual content. And for tweens, it's around 70%. And then for teens, it gets even higher. Our society is just become too isolated. Uh, just losing human touch. And there's no human touch to uh, kind of heal the, the scar or the, the pain. Why do you think all these like suicide and like depression rates are skyrocketing? It's because of social media and nobody's doing anything about it. We gave the stuff to ourselves because we wanted it. And now we get to look, watch it happened to our children. Kids right now are gonna experience the worst of what we're going through. For most of the things that parents can't stand about technology, it's our fault. I don't want to trade my influence for their access to a million different sources of influence that may not be credible. Some parents say, I'm not gonna do anything, I give up, it's too overwhelming. I just, you know, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope that they do okay. As a family, it is the one thing we fight about more than anything. If I had the option to turn things back and give our kids of today a life without social media and smartphones, I would absolutely do it. I would absolutely take away the internet for my kids. Yes, I would have rather grown up without the internet. I mean, I would do it immediately. Take it all away. If social media was gone, like completely, and nobody had it, it'd be a positive. I do long some for my children to know a bit more peace, a bit more calm, a bit more boredom, I have been beating this drum for 20 years. <laughs> and in the last year and a half, that has finally come out and it's music to my ears. Because it's in that peace and calm, and only in that analog peace and calm world that you're going to hear the small, still voice of the Lord calling you by your name, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is hard to hear, isn't it? We're at, a, we're at a very crucial point with AI 2.0 and Metaverse coming because what's going to happen is the church, Hillsong, for example, this is true. I'm not making this up. This is not an accusation against Hillsong or not bashing or anything. They're the first to go totally virtual. One of their big campuses, totally virtual, and Facebook offered that to them in the Metaverse. And God meant for us to be face-to-face -face in the same room, face-to-face. -face. That's what the Scripture teaches. And the Scripture must take precedence over everything. Yeah. I want to show you some things about TikTok. We had been doing lots of research in Australia because they give us access to the kids through law enforcement, which is awesome. And this is, I think, I'm pretty sure that the picture that, I'm, that was up there, there we go, of Nigel and I, we were in ABC News. We were on ABC News. And uh, we had just, I had just crunched, a, well, <laughs> I collected a bunch of data, and then we had police officers in there with a bunch of banks of computers crunching the numbers. And then they gave them to me, and, and I you collated all this stuff and put it together, and, and we had just gone on the radio to say, you know what? Now, this was, mind you, this was before TikTok was a thing on overground, but underground, this thing had exploded. And I went to Nigel, and I said, you know, for the first time in years, there's this thing called TikTok. We better look into this. It has just beat Instagram. And for something to beat Instagram was huge. So we, we went on the secular news and was telling the whole country, hey, you, you need to watch out for this TikTok thing. So being a police officer, he actually read the fine print that all, none of us read when you go into the terms of service. And clearly, everything that is happening on that phone, when you click OK with TikTok, all your data is going to China, right back to Beijing. And the Chinese are tracking whoever does this. And it's in there. And so we were talking about this on the radio, 
And I don't know if you remember when President Trump was trying to ban TikTok. And the American people will always choose entertainment over common sense. Always. Now, I'm not being funny. There was good, solid reason as to why he was doing that. To protect children. To keep our data here. To stop people from tracking our children. But people rose up and stopped him. Love him or hate him, that was the right decision. And, and it broke my heart. The prime minister of Australia tried the same thing. And they shut him down. And we saw that culture now takes preeminence over everything. Everything. Even knowing the assumption is if parents are aware of th something, it matters not anymore. If people are aware that the Chinese are doing it, it doesn't matter anymore. Everybody thinks they're immune. But I want to show you some of TikTok's um, policies and, and what's happening with, with TikTok. You might have seen this this week up in Naples, here in Florida. A father shot a, 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 his a TikTok, his daughter's a TikToker. She had a stalker, and he came to the house with a shotgun, blew the front door open, and dad shot him. But here's, here's the story. Ava Majuri is a growing social media star. Give me like all ideas in the comments. The 15 year old has more than 1.2 million followers on TikTok. Pushed up with no switch on. But last summer, her family says one of those followers showed up at the family's Florida home with a gun. Somebody had attempted to breach the door with, a, I presume, the shotgun. Ava's father, Rob, a retired police lieutenant, sprang into action, saying he eventually shot the intruder. At that point, I took action and neutralized the threat. The majority say the alleged gunman was Eric Justin, an obsessed fan who sent Ava hundreds of messages on her social media accounts. Ava's parents say at one point they allowed their daughter to sell the 18-year-old two selfies she had already posted online, and that he also paid her classmates for information about Ava. But they say Justin then started asking Ava for explicit photos. I had an opportunity to actually text this person and said, hey, you know, she's, uh, she's a minor and you need to not contact her anymore and we notify the authorities. The day of the shooting, authorities telling local media a man was shot and killed while attempting a home invasion without releasing any names. No one was arrested at the time. Overnight, the Collier County Sheriff's Office sending NBC News a heavily redacted police report, calling the case an ongoing investigation. After the incident, the family moved, and Ava started homeschooling. Everything has changed. More security on our end, more reviews of accounts, more checking in, uh, just, just trying to be normal for Ava. Despite the terrifying ordeal, Ava is still posting on social media. Even afterwards, people seemed to say, why? why would you allow this to continue? Uh, it became such a part of her personality and her being that to take it away would, would maybe harm her more. One of her latest posts, a warning to others, writing on Instagram, I hope my experience will be a teaching moment for not just my friends, but social media users of all ages and backgrounds. Ava's dad telling us this was a stand your ground situation and police told him the shooting was deemed justified. But authorities would not comment on that overnight. We reached out to TikTok for comment about this specific story and a spokesperson sent us their company's guidelines for users under the age of 16 saying our platform is designed with the safety of minors in mind. And some of our features are age restricted. But guys, this is just an incredible cautionary tale. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There are video clips out. I wouldn't show here tonight of that child. You realize she's 15, so I'm going to call her a child. She was scantily clad and very creating lust is what she was doing. Can I just call it like it is? And I, I wouldn't show those here tonight, but I, I watched several of the news stories done on this in Naples, and most of her, she's extremely provocative. And one of the options that that drives me crazy is never to take it away. And the reason why her dad lets her keep it, what they're not telling you is she makes a fortune being sponsored. People run ads on her and pay her large sums of money because she has 1.2 million followers. How does she get those followers? By being very sexually explicit. That's how this is working. And 
I can understand people who are not saved doing that and being, but for the believer, for the believer, we're not supposed to cause other people to stumble. We shouldn't do anything like that for money. It's, it's child prostitution if you really want to know what it is. That, that's what it is. It's child prostitution. They're making a bunch of money off of his little daughter, dressing her up like an adult. Sex trafficking, it could be categorized to that. Here's some of the policies of, of TikTok that really conflict with our Christian values. TikTok's business model is built on creating a fun, glossy and glamorous version of the world. And the company's been found to strictly control content that doesn't fit with that image. In March last year, TikTok policy documents were leaked, showing content moderators were instructed to suppress posts by creators considered ugly, poor or disabled. And so what you're left with are social media influencers that have way, way more followers than that girl in Naples. This girl from Australia has got over 5 million. And tomorrow I'll play a video clip of her. And on the outside she looks like that. And they're paying her boatloads of money. But she is very depressed. She's not well. Not everything is as you see on the surface. There's a dark side to all of this. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We should never teach our children to judge people on their cuteness factor. Everybody in the kingdom of God, everybody's accepted equally and loved dearly by God. <laughs> now let me take your temperature. Do you still love me? Because this is heavy. <laughs> no, I'm not fishing for that. I just want to make sure that you understand that I, I'm, I'm, I'm burdened. I'm not mad. This stuff weighs on me constantly. Again, for two weeks. I just want to be a motivational speaker and ride in the front of the plane just for two weeks. That's all I want to do. <laughs> but that's not what God has asked me to do. And I gladly take this up. But I want you to know we're going to end this on a positive note tonight. But we have to pass through the truth in order to be free. Let me show you these stats. These are, these are new. Um, Gen Zers, those born from 97 to 2012, biblical worldview rate, 4%. Millennials, 80, born 81 to 96, 4%. The Gen Xers, those born from 65 to 80, 7%. This is what we're down to in the United States of America. And the Boomers, those born from 46 to 54, only 10% left in this country that have a biblical worldview. Our Western values have collapsed and we're having a Marxist revolution. That's not an internet conspiracy. That's what CRT is. That's what all these school board meetings that have blown up and all this stuff is over that infiltration to supplant and take the place of our Judeo-Christian values. And they've been very open about that. They wanted to destroy the nuclear family. That's a God thing. And how are they doing it? Social media. That is the vehicle. That's how they rally to, have, to burn buildings. They, they organize all that through what? Social media. The teaching of the LGBTQ. Back to TikTok for just a moment. I don't know if you're aware of this, but on TikTok you can take courses. Now, they're not laid out academically with tests and things, but they have whole courses on how to deconstruct your faith. It's called deconstruction. And then there's podcasts dedicated to it. Kevin Max, for example, of DC Talk, completely walked away from Jesus and went on there and deconstructed his faith. Where do children learn about gender dysphoria? TikTok and YouTube. I was telling Pastor Alex, I wrote an article for... Uh, uh, a ma couple of magazines called Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria. This is, the, this is one of the latest things that is happening. The big thing now is transition. So you got all this controversy going on with the sports. You know, you have dudes who say, I'm a woman, and because they say that, you got to accept them like they are and play in their little make-believe world and let them compete in sports designed for women, and so they are crushing everybody because they're dudes competing against women. 
I know I'm supposed to be compassionate or something, but I'm mad, so I'm not going to do that. Because it's dumb. It's just dumb. So here's what's happening. There, gender dysphoria is a real thing. I mean, there are people uh, who, who question, but the majority, not all, but the majority of it's demonic. But let me explain. Here's what's happening on the Internet right now. Kids go to school. They get flooded with this curriculum. They go on TikTok. They learn how you know, to transition and how to deal with their parents and what their rights are and all this sort of stuff. And in many cases, the parents are fine with it. So let's just say the girl comes home and says, I want to be a boy. And so she says, okay, um, let's celebrate. We're going to get you some breast augmentation now. We're going to you know, have you this surgery, get you the hormone treatments, whatever level you want. And the mother goes, this is great. Let's have a party and celebrate. Bring your friends over. We'll have a party. Now, this is happening all over the world. And so the mother will organize a party. 10 or 15 of the friends will come over, and they'll stream it. They'll, they'll videotape it because it's what you do now. You put everything on social media, right? So that, and, and the, the research that I'm referring to here is secular. So what will happen is maybe 10 out of the 15 kids, have, as the, the, the child is sitting there describing how they now feel like they're a different sex and they want to transition, all of a sudden, rapidly... Ten of the others say, I want to do it too. And so they start the whole process. And that's called rapid onset gender dysphoria. And they describe it in the literature as a contagion. I call it demonic. I believe it's a spirit that just jumps on them. But, but even aside from that, the secular people say it's rapid. It's onset. It's contagion. And, and so this is how it's just spreading exponentially through social media. Social media. At what point, brothers and sisters, do we stop saying, well, social media is a good tool? You know, that's the excuse to keep all the bad stuff. You know that, don't you? And I'm not saying you should throw it all away. But, but for those who say that to keep the bad stuff, it's, it's time to stop. It's time to repent. And they say, it's just a tool. It's not just a tool. It was designed to addict you with dopamine. Lots of money has been spent on neuroscience to do that to the entire culture. One of the guys, if you saw this, did anybody see The Social Dilemma? The, the documentary Social Dilemma? The guy that invented the like button on Facebook quit because he started feeling guilty. And now he's on a speaking tour repenting. Some of you didn't know how to clap for that. You're thinking, well, I like that like button. I'm not sure I want to clap for that. <laughs> so what we have now, we have one in six of our Gen Zers identifying as LGBTQ. That's what the latest stats say from Gallup and the Colson Center. This stuff weighs on me. This is the call that God has given me. And the reason it all comes back to social media, and I want to show you this as well, and then we'll lighten it up just a little bit and talk about some practical things. I was just in West Palm Beach at a big school for two days, Monday and Tuesday, and I spoke to the parents, there were staff, I spoke in the classroom, I did a parent meeting at night, and I asked these, I did just the sixth grade, it's a big school, and I had them close their eyes, bow their heads, and I didn't want them to answer out of peer pressure. So I didn't want them to feel like they had to answer to be cool because they're friends. You get, you get what I'm saying? So I had them close their eyes, put their heads down, threatened to taser them if they didn't. So they went like this real quick. I had no taser, but I just lied to them, and it worked. So it's like our Baptist friends. You just do it and get forgiveness later. Okay, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> Pastor Alex, I hope the emails come to you instead of me. Um, <laughs> you do know I was joking, right? Have a sense of humor. <laughs> Thank you. And if you are still mad, it's Pastor Alex at OceansUnite.com. All right, so. <laughs> so I had the kids bow their heads, close their eyes, and I said, How many of you have internet connected devices in your bedroom overnight? Every hand goes up. What, are, what is in there? Tablets, phones, video game consoles, you name it. 
So their parents show up for the parent meeting that night. We're in this big auditorium, and I ask them the same question. I said, how many of you allow your children to have Internet-connected devices in their bedroom overnight? Two hands went up out of the whole auditorium, two. That's just common. It happens all over the world. So then I took this picture, and I said, well, let's see how your children answered that this morning. And I put that picture up there, and I said, now, let's try this again and not lie this time. How many of you do it? Get your hands up. And sheepishly, the hands go up. You better get real. 80% of all this stuff, 80% I estimate, and I'm not the only one that estimates that, 80% of all this stuff I've been covering with you happens in the bedroom with the door shut. That's where it happens. And you've got to get that stuff out of there. And this is going to sound weird. The bedroom should be used as a place to sleep. <laughs> so before I went, I sent some surveys down. I, I took some of the surveys that we use when I'm working with law enforcement, modified it a little bit, but it's essentially the same thing, and I wanted to get a, a feel for what sixth graders are doing. And if you have a big enough focus group, which I had 150-some of these, I think it was, it, it was way more than you needed to constitute a legitimate study, Okay. So let me show you this. Um, I just wanted to know which social media platforms you use. And you see the two, TikTok and Roblox, almost equal. You see that? By far. In the bedroom, all the time, sixth grade. I asked them, how many hours of video games a week are you playing? Three to four. And look, these numbers um, definitely are lower than what the national averages are. And I, I, I don't, I can only speculate. I speculate that they were being honest, but perceptually, you know how it is when you, on social media, and you said, okay, I was about five minutes, but if you were to actually time it, it would be 30 minutes. That's how, I don't think these kids are evil by answering that way. I just think they're too low based on other studies. But be that as it may, that, those are the actual numbers. But here's the one that you should pay attention to. Because they're on social media, so much. I asked this question, sixth grade, have you ever chatted with someone online that you do not know? Look how many answered yes. That should bother you. That should bother you. Sixth grade. We, we do this in the fourth and fifth grade. The numbers are the same. Online bullying. It, that may seem low, but do you understand that two out of every ten is way too high because when you're bullied, you have brain scans, the equivalent of post-traumatic stress disorder, and then they cut themselves, and they cope, and they, it, it spirals out of control? The numbers are off the charts. I ask this question. If you play video games, are you aware of age restrictions for online games? And this is disturbing because most of them are playing games and they have lied when they click the terms of agreement about their age. That's not a Christian value to lie. Amen? And then I asked, what are your favorite social media influencers, Netflix shows, it series? Here's the Netflix series. Some of these are horrible. And they're binge watching late at night in their bedrooms, sixth grade. This is the social, their favorite social media influencers. Some of these people are absolutely foul. These people should not be their heroes. These are the YouTube channels that they like. Some of them are innocuous. Some of them are horrible. But this is what they're feasting on in their bedrooms with the door shut. And then I ask them, what are your favorite video games? Some of them... Even content-wise, even if they're harmless, they're still harming the brain, but then some of this stuff is terrible. Parents don't... Look, I, I don't want to falsely accuse you, but I can just tell you that I know they're out of your hair, and the technology's done a wonderful thing so that it frees you up to do your technology. But brothers and sisters, we have got to come out from the world and separate ourselves, stop touching unclean things so that God will receive us. And I'm being sincere. Pastor Alex, thank you for this platform. It is so hard to get speaking engagements in this country. I don't, have to, I don't ask for them. 
I like a weekend off. <laughs> but thank you. It is so, God keeps me busy, but I'm telling you, it's a miracle that I even get to speak anywhere in this atmosphere. And you guys are clapping, and I love you, and I mean it. Thank you. All right, let's, let's have a little fun. I did this the last time I was here. Tomorrow I will continue. I will re- review a little bit of this uh, for those of you that are able to make it, and then I'll, I'll do a different segment on TikTok because there's so much. You know it's a big topic. I can go on and on and on. Has it helped you so far, though? Okay. Let me, uh, I, I gave this poetry test the last time I was here, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that if you think, okay, I remembered it, I'll get it this time, I changed it, because <laughs> I'm smarter than you. All right, so, uh, no, just William, my bad. <laughs> I love you, don't you shoot me. So, um, basically, all this stuff that we're talking about never starts with people rushing as Christians, now, secular, it's a little different, but... Christians don't just rush right in usually to the pornography stuff. It starts somewhere usually harmless. And I've asked this question before, but there's so many new people here. Isn't it awesome that so many new people here since the last time I was here? It's grown. So let me ask the question, and those of you that know the question that I'm about to ask, just sit there and smile at me and don't wreck the thing, all right? So <laughs> how many of you can multitask? Raise your hand if you're pretty good at it. Pretty good at it, Okay. Um, how many of you think that men are worse at it than women? Okay. Now, there's some truth in that. There is. There's truth in that. Like, like in analog multitasking, if you've got a bunch of kids and they're rummaging, pillaging, and burning the house down and all that stuff, mom can manage all that and the dishes and all this stuff. And where's dad? He's on the couch because if dad had to manage all that, the children would die, right? <laughs> okay. So, so... That's not the kind of multitasking I'm talking about. I'm talking about where the phone is buzzing. You're sitting in front of the computer, and there's multiple tabs, and you're jumping all over the place, and you think that you can retain all that information simultaneous. So by definition, what multitasking is, the, is the ability to retain two or, the data from two or more streams of information coming into the brain simultaneous. And it used to be believed that the brain was similar to a multi-core processor where you could do that, and then it was actually tested in neuroscience laboratories extensively, and they went, oops, <laughs> nobody on earth, including Einstein, can do it because the brain is a sequential processor. It means it can only do one thing at a time, and so what ends up happening is we end up switch tasking. So for those of you that really honestly think, and most people think they're the exception to that, no, I can really do it. They do. They they intuitively think. And so because I know this, I'm going to ask you to multitask. I'm not going to ask you to do five or six things that you normally juggle at a time. I'm only going to ask you to do two things at the same time. And what I'm going to do is put a written poem up on the screen. And then at the same time, I'm going to play a second and different poem being read audibly. And what I want you to do is pay attention to both of them at the same time. And then I'm going to give you a cognitive test to see how well your brain receives Two streams of data simultaneous. (laughs) You ready for this? All right. I know it's going to sound weird, but look at the screen. (laughs) All right, you ready? (laughs) The moon seems very lovely. Each night it passes by, so beautiful and shiny upon the velvet sky. And yet the moon is really dead. Its light is not its own. Though shiny it may seem, it's really just a stone. Okay, how many of you gave it a go? You tried. How many of you got two seconds into it and said, nope, this is not going to happen? <laughs> How many of you said, after about three seconds, said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to pick one and do the best I can on this stupid thing. Okay. How many of you, how many of you picked the written one? It's because you're lazy. Now, <laughs> yeah, you are. You're lazy. I love you and all, but you're just flat out lazy. No challenge in you whatsoever, you motivationless people. So, Here's the test. I don't want you to quote both poems. I just want to know who can quote word for word, accurately, dead accurately, the first two lines of each poem. That's what I thought. (laughs) I've given this to hundreds of thousands of people, and never once has anyone gotten it right. The reason why is because if you are reading, you're not hearing. And then you switch. And when you switch, now you can't read. And so you are only garnering little bits and pieces, and then your brain defaulted to what it was created to do. Notice I use the word created. 
evolutionists every now and again do it accidentally, and I'm like, yes, you're on to it. But <laughs> your brain defaulted to sequential processing. One thing. It unitasked. Forget it. I'll just pick one. And so if you want, well, they found incidentally that when people attempted to multitask, their productivity dropped 40%. And the, the cognition, the retention, went to pot. And so what ends up happening is, if you study like that, or you work in your office environment like that, going all over the place, the hippocampus in the brain is a short-term memory, and it fills up like a little thimble with water dripping in it throughout the day. And at night when you sleep, if you sleep the proper amount for your age, and you sleep in the deep stages going in and out like you're supposed to, that is when that transference from short-term memory takes place into long-term memory. And in the optimal condition, it transfers it in what's called a schema, which is a continuous, uh, contiguous stream of data so that when you go to retrieve that in the brain and you need to recall what you studied, it's all there in one stream and you can remember it. When you jump around like that, it scatters it in the brain, leaving you with a scattered brain. And you can't draw associations between the things that you learn. So a teacher, for example will on Thursday say, okay, we're going to now do these formulas that we began on Tuesday. And the kids, some of the kids will go, we didn't cover formulas on Tuesday. And the teacher's going, I have it here. I can prove it to you. That we, no, you didn't cover that. And, and when I do this with teach, professional development teachers, they love me. And the light goes on. And so it has caused communication problems in marriage from being like this all the time academically, certainly with God, being fragmented all the time. And so what we want to do is make sure, and the dopamine levels just go completely off the charts when you, when you function like this. So when you hear me talk about men, I told you I don't have any notifications on my phone ever. It's so that my brain doesn't do that. And I walk around most days, not all the time, most days with peace. I do. Because I'm not, I'm not instantly available except to Beth. She's the only one on my favorites. And, and she can get to me anytime she wants to. And, and I, I, I had to wrestle with that at the beginning. And I'm writing a whole book about how to cope with this and yet still use technology for the good thing that it can be. So let's look at this briefly. You sit down in the office to do a report for the boss or let's say math. And here's what's happening. I ask kids all over the world, how many of you when you sit down to do math you're listening to music at the same time with your earbuds. Every hand goes up. I have pictures. Every hand goes up. And I tell them, um, well, number one, now your brain is toggling, switching back and forth. And they're, uh -uh. I'm like, I know more than you. You should listen to me. You just, you're dumb, so listen to the smart one. And <laughs> well, they're thinking that about me, so I may as well say it to them. <laughs> so, so, they sit down to do their math, and they've got a wall in their brain because they bring this wall to math, right? Math is going to generate the proper amount of dopamine for learning, cognition. Problem is, that activity is not penetrating that barrier, so guess what? They are bored. So they listen to music, which generates dopamine. So problem number one, they got too much dopamine, or they're generating dopamine, but the brain's switching. And so they will then go over and grab some dopamine. And there was a study done. How long does a student study a legitimate subject like math, English, and history before they grab their phone and check something? I asked students the other day, how, how long do you study? And this is the common answer. I study about 20 minutes, and I check social media for five. Take a brain break. The actual numbers are they study math for two minutes. <laughs> and then they're gone for anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. And this is why the grades have gone down. And the kids want to blame the math app. But the truth is it's TikTok. That's the truth. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So let's put this back up here. So then they jump back. And this toggling is wreaking havoc with the information being transferred into the brain. And it is causing way too much dopamine. And the last thing I want to do with you tonight before I pray with you is show you how to fix this and particularly apply this to your prayer life. And the word is called monotasking. Live your life one moment at a time. 
When you're with God, that's all you're doing. When you're with your spouse, that's it. I'm, not, I'm trying to model this to you, not because I'm perfect or any of that sort of stuff, but when Beth and I go to dinner, we eat out a lot because we travel a lot. The phones are in the car. I'm with her. Because I'm attached to her, not the phone. And I have not always been that way. So here's how you fix it. When you sit down to do your Bible study, the report for the boss, your math, anything that involves cognition, total silence. Do you know we have a whole two generations now that hate to face themselves? They have to have noise. They do not want to face themselves. They're not at peace with themselves because of the junk that's in their life. And the starting point is not this, the starting point is being introduced or reintroduced or rekindling your relationship with the Prince of Peace, the mighty God who forgives every sin and throws them into the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more. And then you can live with yourself. He loves you, brothers and sisters. Men, we had a good weekend, didn't we? We, we talked about a lot of bad stuff, but we're forgiven, aren't we? We're heathen. <laughs> redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. All right. Total silence, which means no music. <laughs> Teenagers will do this. Well, I read a study that says that <laughs> classical music is good for you. I'm like, first of all, you don't listen to classical music, you evil little creature, so don't try that with me. <laughs> it's true. They do. They do everything. I read the video games improve hand-eye coordination. <laughs> like, it does say that. May I quote part two? No, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's put this back up before I wax too eloquent here. No phone, because that's where it's all coming from. And then before we even get into this, no entertainment tabs. And I added this during the pandemic because the reason why the attrition rate or the failure rate of online courses is so high is because there's a tab with Zoom and what they're supposed to be doing academically or Google Classroom, whatever platform they're using, but then there's also TikTok and there's porn and there's Facebook and there's email. And the vast majority of the time spent on those entertainment tabs as opposed to what they should be doing, but they want to blame the failure on this inadequacy on the academic platform when it's all the time has been spent over here. But you're not fooling me. And so... When I say no entertainment tabs, do you understand what I mean by that now? So when you sit down to do your math, that's all you do in silence. Cognition goes to the roof, and then you do your history, and then you do your English. If you need a brain break, it needs to be analog. You don't pick up your phone and check something. You play with the dog. You throw rocks at your neighbors or anything. But <laughs> I was at a meeting one time, and there were police were on the front row, and they said, don't say that. And I'm like, well, then you'll get to tase them. Okay, say that. So <laughs> it was just a joke. Okay. Now, listen, I'm being very sincere. You won't hear me say throwaway technology, but the scripture that I always use, I quoted it to the men. I'm going to quote it to you now. It's out of Corinthians. All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. So the, this is permissible. The phone is permissible. I'm going to give you Several things here that are not beneficial that you should get rid of. Not everything, but here's the bones you need to just spit out. You need to spit out Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok and never use them ever again. Ever. Somebody clap. I dare you. You are awesome. Last time I was here, I told these boys... You should take his video game consoles out and shoot them. And they did. <laughs> I'm still waiting on the video because I would have played it tonight. It's a redneck fest and you should have one. <laughs> All right, up here. You should never play video games ever again. Ever again. Ever again. <laughs> All right. I'm going to end this way. 
Um, there are two, and we'll pick it up tomorrow. I'll cover some of this, but and I know some of you won't be here tomorrow, but I've given you plenty tonight. No, if I could leave you with this, if since 80% of the problems happen with technology in the bedroom, no technology or television in the bedroom ever. And that will go a long way toward helping you. Now, you're not finished, but obviously it will go a long way. So here's, the, here's, here's my closing passage of Scripture. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. As Christians, we are to be counterculture people. I'm not saying to throw it all away, but make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. God has a very, very specific call on your life. And I want to apply that passage of Scripture, separation, this way. If I were to grab any phone, tablet, or computer in the world, I would find something similar to this. I would have education things on there. I would see that from Google Docs, and I would see Google Sheets, or I'd see Excel, PowerPoint. But I would also find Fortnite, Google Classroom, Netflix, Minecraft, Snapchat, TikTok, Word, Instagram, Porn, and YouTube. If I were to apply that separation, this is what it would look like. The things on the right are not the things that are causing the problem. These are the things that are productive, useful, helpful, and will get you a job. The things on the left are the things that are causing brain scans to go berserk. No one has ever come to me and said, Brad, would you pray for me? I'm so addicted to Word. Just can't stop typing. <laughs> but I had a lot of prayer requests this weekend for porn addiction. See the difference? It's permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Spit out the things that are not beneficial and be holy, for he is holy. Amen? All right, let's stand. It's been fun to be with you tonight with such a hard message. And I hope you've enjoyed it. If I could have someone come up and play softly, I just want us to pray tonight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask us to just come around the altar. And I believe God's going to do something in the Holy Spirit tonight. And what I'm going to ask him to do is to take that intimacy that all of us, and myself included, I've done this, where I've given my intimacy to a device. So I'm not judging you. But if you're hungry tonight, how many of you are hungry for God tonight? You're here on a Saturday night, you must be. It's awesome. In the spirit, this is what science cannot do for you or me. Science is helpful to understand this stuff, but now it comes apart where only God can do this, but God will do this because he loves us despite what we've done because of the cross, we can come to him despite our wickedness. But in the spirit tonight, if you will humble yourself under God's mighty hand and come to this altar because you are hungry and you have affections that you have given to something that you should not have, he will forgive you first of all. But I believe all, with all of my heart, this is the call that's on my life to deal with this stuff. He will take those affections that you have put on something like a phone, things on the phone, and he will help you by the power of the Spirit of God through the precious blood of Jesus that broke that bondage at the cross. And take that and transfer it back onto him where it belongs in an instant. Because he loves you. So simply put, if you are hungry for God to have that intimacy put back where it belongs, just come. Just come and stand right here and let's just close in prayer tonight. Can we do that? Look over here at these young people. Give them a big hand. Can we do that? I am so thankful that you're coming up here. I'm the first one up here because I need help too. Every day I struggle with this just like you do. I have things in my life. I, I'm so good. I keep coming back to the men's conference. Wasn't it good to just be real, guys? Wasn't it just to be real? To be real, just come on. And we're going to enter into prayer again, and I'm just going to pray and ask God to help you with whatever it is that you are struggling with. And, and look, these bondages run deep with video game addiction. Tonight will be your starting point. The battle will be when you leave here. But I'm going to ask God to deposit something in you of power and hunger that if you will continue to press into God, He will deliver you. How many of you felt the presence of God during worship tonight? Right at the end, it was so powerful, wasn't it? 
do you realize that you can have this Monday morning? You don't need to wait to come in here. In fact, you shouldn't. You should, you should make and prepare a place for God to come on Monday morning. He'll come just like he did in worship tonight. That's going to be your deliverance and your sustaining deliverance. All right, let's put our hands up and let's surrender to him tonight. Can we do that? Father, I am so honored to be here. I feel like I'm home. And my tanks have gotten full where normally they're draining. And I want to thank you for Pastor Alex and my friends here who are worshiping with me tonight. I'm not standing here superior at all. I need them. You've provided them for me. And I ask you to bless them for coming up here tonight and humbling themselves. I'm encouraged by it. And by the way, anybody else, you need to get up here. You just come. If you humble yourself under God's mighty hand in due season, he will lift you up. Father, I pray for these precious grandparents who are helping to raise their grandkids as though they're their own children. And they're burdened, Lord. I, I, I hug so many grandparents all over the world who are just, they cry over their grandkids. And so, Lord, I know that's probably represented here. And I want to start by praying for them that, God, that you will use them and somehow allow them to take this message back in for, to their kids and their grandkids. But, Lord, deposit an anointing on them tonight to do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these who are making decisions tonight about what they're going to do with their social media, what they're going to do with their video games, what they're going to do with their porn addiction. And Lord, I'm asking you, first of all, don't let a spirit of fear or condemnation come on them. Please, Lord, do not let a spirit of fear and condemnation come. Father, I pray that a joy will well up within them because they know now they're forgiven. Whatever it is, brothers and sisters, that you've come here to, to give to God, give it to Him, ask Him to forgive you, and then receive the forgiveness. That's why I came, is to tell you that. Lord, in the mighty name of the King of Kings, as our hands are raised, I'm asking you to take that intimacy that has been misplaced and put on things that they shouldn't be and in the spirit, in our spirits, by the power of God, by the washing of the word tonight, by the cross and the power of the cross that you will help all of us to take those intimacies and put them right back on you where they belong in this moment, supernaturally, God, to begin that process. And then give us the discipline that we need day in and day out to keep the freedom. But Father, many are wrestling on what to do because their jobs are tied in with social media. I get that. And so, Lord, you said if we lack wisdom to, give, to, to ask you, and you would give it to, it to us generously and not find fault with us. Give generous, generous wisdom. Breathe on my family here tonight on how to cope with this. And to put these things into place so that Jesus is Lord instead of technology being Lord. Lord, there's purity of heart here. You can just, I can feel it. And Lord, I don't have all of the answers, but I'm, I'm interceding on their behalf, God. I'm standing in the gap, making up the hedge as best I can with the call that you've given me. Please speak to them and give them strategies, God, to put these things into place. To separate themselves from the worldliness of this. And keep only those things that are beneficial. Father, I pray for the parents who now have to go home and deal with this. And parents, I want to speak to you. I'm going to stop praying for a moment. I want you to keep your eyes closed. I want to give you some advice. What you don't want to do is go home and grab everything and throw it away. Now, eventually that's going to have to happen. But you don't start that way. What I'm going to ask God to do is to give you the grace to do this. Is if, you, if you're making up your mind right now that you're going to get this thing under control in your home, here's where you start. You go home and you apologize to your children. Because the chances are you have not set a good example. And you also purchased the stuff at some level. So you're not under condemnation, but you're going to go home and you're going to say, Look, you heard him speak. I've heard him speak. I'm the parent. And my apologies, I have not set a good example, and I ask you to forgive me.
And I promise you, if you start that way, instead of being combative, it'll go a lot smoother. And then if you say to them, we're going to work on this together, but ultimately I am the parent, and what I say goes, but we are going to work on this and solve this as a family. And forgive me, because I bought this stuff, and now I'm going to have to take most of it away, and we're going to have to deal with this, and it's going to be uncomfortable for about three weeks, and then it's going to get better. We're all going to live. And you stay the course, God will help you. But be kind when you go home. Father, I pray that you will make, tailor make a solution for each individual circumstance based on what I just spoke to them with kindness, though, that they'll be gentle, kind, but very firm, and actually follow through and do this. And I pray that parents will have favor with their kids to do this. Satan, I rebuke you. It is written in the word of God that when we resist you, you shall flee. And I rebuke you. The doors that have been opened through this filth and all of this swill, I rebuke you. These precious people of God have repented. You now have no legal ground. I command you to leave. In Jesus' name.